All right, all right. You know what? Let's just do, let's do like a mini cooking mama. Let's do a mini cooking mama. All right, everybody. We're going to watch this sweet potato one because I want to see this really bad. And I wanted to watch this with you all. So we're just going to do like a little impromptu cooking mama, like short cooking mama. I'll watch the gooey duck video and I'll watch the sweet potato video. And then we'll talk about Kanye West. Isn't gooey duck a East Coast thing? No. Gooey duck is a West Coast thing. What the fuck? Isn't Geoduck a Pokemon? Yes, but Gooey Duck, the actual thing, is is a big, it's like a big clam kind of thing. Look, it looks like this, here. It looks like this, it's this. This is what a Gooey Duck looks like. Look at it. It's like a gigantic clam with a huge neck. It's a cock? No, it's not a cock. If you use it that way, that's between you and and the devil. All right. Let's watch this. Let's watch this thing. I want to see. This is apparently somebody who's never seen a sweet potato before. I came across these. These were in a bag, and it said sweet potatoes. I don't know what this is. It doesn't even really look like a potato. What exactly makes it, why they call it a sweet potato, it doesn't smell sweet. Actually kind of smells a little bit bad. They look like garbage. This one looks like the skin is like going to, like dry off or something. I think this might be a little bit too big for the... Hmm. That one fits. But anyway, so I want to see if these sweet potatoes will will work in the same thing. I don't even know what country these things come from. It's... They're very strange to me. So let's do this. Oh! Wait a minute. Why are they orange? This how do you, how do you, how do you go like your, like, sweet potatoes are remarkably fucking, remarkably fucking common. How do you not know, like, uh, but this guy sounds genuine, so I have to give him credit. If he's faking his surprise, he's doing a really good job. Is there, is there something wrong with them? Why are they orange? What kind of... What kind of potato is orange? I don't under what I don't understand. What's what's happening here? What country are these things from? Are they all orange? Oh, this one might be just a little bit too long. They are orange. All of them. He lives in a food desert? Do you really think so? Is it really a food desert? This thing does kind of struggle just a well, little bit. I don't bit want with to be rude, potatoes. but like you guys, you're gonna have to educate me in the comments. I don't understand. Where do they grow? How do you where do you grow a potato to make it orange? And why is it sweet? It doesn't it just smells like a regular potato. Oh. It did it. Is there something wrong with these potatoes? Why are they orange? They, they must be must mu they must be much more dense. Because this thing struggles quite a bit. I want to get this one in there. I need to cut it off. Use my special culinary sword. <laughs> the culinary katana? Hmm. Maybe we'll cut a little off here. Here we go. This is our last one. Still works. Nothing stops this thing. All right, so that is that is our potato slicer. I'm really surprised that so far this episode, like everything is just working beautifully. Like normally there's like at least something that's garbage by now. I need to do like some research or something about these potatoes because these... Uh... I especially don't know how you don't know what like a sweet potato is right now. Like sweet potatoes are like a meme because every single restaurant on the goddamn planet does like the does the sweet potato fry thing. Everybody's into those. I'm 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 impressed that this guy doesn't like, you know. Why is the focus slightly off? So annoying. There we go. Sweet potato fries are the best. I quite like sweet potato fries. Believe it or not, I'm not the biggest fan of sweet potatoes in and of themselves, but, um... Did you know that sweet potatoes were found in the Pacific Islands, proving that the Polynesian and Austro Austronesian cultures would have been the first people after the natives to make it to the Americas? Yeah, that sounds legitimate. That's fucking awesome.
who's never had a vegetable before, uh, I surely hope no one here. I would be, actually, I would be kind of impressed if somebody made it to the point in life where they were able to chat in a web chat without ever having eaten a vegetable. So, you know. What if he knows them as yams and just hasn't cooked with them as an adult? I don't know about that. It's possible, I guess. Okay, so hold on a second. What is the, is there an actual difference between a sweet potato and a yam? Because I always get, I always hear mixed things. Yam versus sweet potato. Aren't they just different types of roots? There's like a little bit of a difference. Sweet potatoes. Ah, here we go. Okay. Oh yeah, this kind of makes sense. Because yams aren't orange. I know that much. Thin reddish brown skin, rough textured brown skin, orange, white, or purple flesh, pale, starchy flesh, sweet flavor, neutral flavor, sometimes called a yam in U.S. grocery stores. Okay, so here in the U.S., sweet potatoes and yams are, used, are, are interchangeable. Not widely available in U.S. grocery stores. Well, okay, yeah, maybe that's like mainstream ones. You can get this type of yam really, really easily in like an Asian market or something like that. Sweet taters. Yep. 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 All right. All right. Let's watch the gooey duck video. All right. We ready? I've had enough of the sweet potatoes. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm impressed. Dumb men are cute sometimes. Well, I never said he wasn't like, I didn't say he was a bad person. I'm just surprised. I'm just shocked. You know, like not knowing what a sweet potato is. It's kind of like not knowing what a carrot is, right? All right, let's watch the gooey duck thing. So this is a little bit of a longer video. This is learning about how to clean and eat a gooey duck. This is probably gonna be a little gross. All right, let's watch it though. Damn, look at that. What the hell? I've never Greetings, seen this Greetings, my beautiful lovelies. It's Emmy. Welcome back. Today's video is Thank sponsored you. by Bright Cellars, the monthly wine subscription box that comes right to your doorstep. Take the seven question quiz and wines will be matched to your taste preferences. So Bright Cellars makes it a no brainer. I love the fact that I take the quiz and the wine choices are personalized to my own taste. Another great thing, particularly during these times of social distancing and self-isolation, is that the wines are delivered right to my doorstep. There's no need for me to even leave my house, and I know the wines will be ones that I enjoy because they're based awesome, on Berman my Hans. preferences. Another great thing about Bright Sellers is their emphasis on education. Ashri, Ashri Jake says, Demon Mama hadn't considered that the guy, the sweet potato guy's rural aesthetic is fake and that he grew up in an urban area, the child of upper middle class parents with a bland diet. I feel like upper, like upper middle class people are like, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe, maybe you could be right. You could be correct. Each bottle of wine Actually. comes with these really informed. Is this a sea creature? Yes. A gooey duck is a, it is a mollusk. So it, it lives in the mud beautiful cards that have all the information about the wine, where the wine came from, what temperature it should be served at. So much information, which I love. I love learning about new things, including wine. This is my second Bright Cellars box, and what I appreciate is that the selection is more- A gooey duck looks like a blackhead? Um... Are- you need to see a dermatologist. <laughs> Okay, hold on a second. <laughs> if you if you have blackheads that look like this, if you have a blackhead that looks like this, you need to go to the fucking doctor. Like, holy shit. tailored to my preferences based on my opinions of my last box. I'm going to taste the Mojave Rain and this is a Merlot. It comes from the north coast Damn, of this California. Is a long, uh, no offense, Cheers. but I think I'm going to fast forward just a little bit. This is a long oh, ad. That's nice. So this is a really great wine for me. It's a medium bodied wine. It's not too assertive, not very lovely. The test is okay. Here we go. Geo duck, but it's pronounced gooey duck. It actually comes from a Nisqually word for this creature, which is a very long lived clam. The average age of these clams is 140 years. It's Holy the largest shit. bivalve. 
That's sick as hell. They live so long. That's the average. So some of them probably live for like 200 fucking years. Damn. On this planet. Ancient beasts. And it looks very. Sus, sus, it looks sus. Very phallic. Now, I've eaten plenty of phallic things on this channel, including a banana candle, including actual penis in penis ox soup. But okay. this yep. definitely okay. takes the cake. My lovelies, I give you the gooey duck. <laughs> okay, my lovelies. I present to you the gooey duck. Isn't it amazing? Look at this. This phallic portion is the siphon. The clam lives in the sand. The siphon goes all the way up to the surface. This stretches at least two times its length. And that's how the clam breathes. It's a bivalve, there are two shells, and I'm going to be eating it raw sashimi style and this is the part that's really coveted this is the siphon or the neck or the shaft what? i know i know <laughs> of the clam inside here is the stomach in japan they boil the stomach and it can be eaten and then this top part here is sometimes called the belly or the breast it can be deep fried or it can also be sliced thinly and eaten sashimi style as well so here we are, gooey duck. So the reason why I decided to do a video about gooey duck is because I recently read an article in Eater. Damn. You know what? This is just proof, by the way. The existence of the gooey duck is proof that nature loves creatures with both breasts and dicks. Which I'll put the link down below, which talked about how some businesses are really struggling because there's been a huge drop in demand for gooey duck because of COVID-19. So I thought in solidarity and in support, I would purchase a gooey duck, it was $80. It was overnighted to me. It smells of the ocean, perfectly fresh. It came packed in ice, just $80. overnighted to me, super fresh. I also purchased a box of oyster Hold on a second. That is so much. Holy shit. Okay, so she's not a local, that's for sure. These things are like, they're like, they're like between 15 and $30 locally. And yes, they are fancy. Um. A lot of people eat it around here. It is a uh, delicacy in the Seattle area. Okay. For one that big? Oh, I don't know about that size. Yeah, I don't know about that size. You might be right for that size. Babe, are you okay? You've hardly touched your giant dick clam breast. Here's a sampler pack. It's my husband's birthday. And they too were beautifully packed. They came with a shucker. Just top-notch quality. So during these tumultuous times, I think it's really important to support small businesses like Taylor Shellfish. So true, Sim support small businesses like Demon Mama. Demon Mama is the definition of a small business. We're really, really small. So yeah, you know, support, you know, throw some love my way. Support, you know, din donate, uh, join the Patreon, support the show, give us your likes and your subscribes. That's why I'm going to have my first taste of gooey duck. <laughs> so I watched a few YouTube videos on how to prepare this beautiful thing, and I will put the See links you, down Thanks below. Thanks for coming. Becky Selguts and Chef Step. So thank you guys for educating me about this, this beautiful thing. So we're gonna quickly blanch the gooey duck, and that's gonna allow us to remove this skin covering the shaft. I mean, I know, I know. Double entendres, let's do it. Put the gooey duck into a bowl. It's so big, it barely fits into the bowl. I hate to bend the shaft, but... Now I've got some boiling water, and I'm gonna pour this over the clam. So look how the skin is already blistering. We're just gonna put it in there for about 15 seconds. Not much God. time at all. All right, so I think that's enough time. It's already puffed up. Oh, oh goodness. And dunk it in some ice water. Oh. Cool back down. Mm -hmm. Is this what bottom surgery is like? Style, yeah, basically, and exactly. We're going to eat this raw. So the gooey duck 
Siphon has really prized great crunchy texture and we want to preserve that. We don't want to cook this. We're going to be eating it like you would eat oysters on the half shell. We're going to eat this raw. The reason why we're blanching it is to clean it up and also to get it out of its shell with a little bit more ease. Give thanks to the gooey duck. Give thanks. And now we're going to take the gooey duck out of its shell. Take a knife and just run it beneath the shell here. We're going to loosen it from this side. I'm going to pry it apart. Look at that. Isn't that incredible? Look at this. The shell looks actually very similar to what we call steamers here in New England. It's kind of a thinner shell, but each one of these rings represents a year. So beautiful specimen here. So same thing on this side. We're going to Ah, oh, it smells so good. It smells of the ocean. So right here is the stomach. Look at that. Is that amazing? Look at that. I mean, if that doesn't look like testes, I mean, mother nature, you are incredible. We're gonna cut that right there. And in Japan, they boil this and this can be eaten. So I'm gonna set this aside. Now this beautiful part here that was holding the stomach is called either the breast or the belly. And it's much this softer actually in super texture, interesting. and this can be sliced and fried or also eaten raw like sashimi. So I'm gonna taste that as well. I'm gonna cut this right at the base here. So we're gonna peel all of this off. I know. Okay, the one thing I will Are say you... is that I would be so fucking nervous. I would be so fucking nervous to, uh, to eat like raw shellfish, even like, even of this quality. Like, holy shit, I would be so fucking nervous. You men out there cringing? Don't worry, it doesn't hurt. It's all good. You're already dead. So we're gonna pull that off. And there is the gooey duck siphon. And here is the skin of the outsides. You can really see how far the gooey duck siphon really can stretch. Look at that. It's probably three times the length of it now. Wild. Incredible. Incredible. Uh, I've had I've had raw oysters before, but I've always been told you should be very careful about where you get raw oysters because it's super easy to get sick. Slice this open. Butterfly it. This is what it looks like inside. And as you can see, there's some sand in there, some muck. So we're gonna rinse that out. Now we're gonna thinly slice this. Wow, that looks fascinating though. The worst food poisoning I've ever had was from fucking chicken. I got salmonella once from a restaurant and it was so bad. Yeah, true. Yeah, as Retcon says, yeah, you gotta buy your seafood off the back of a rusty pickup truck in an empty parking lot that used to be a Denny's or a paintball store. <laughs> fucking true! <laughs> fucking the only trustworthy seafood in the world. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited about this. I remember reading about gooey duck years and years and years and years and years ago. And I thought, someday I'm gonna go to Seattle and taste gooey duck myself. I still might do that, but in the meanwhile, I can do a beautiful thing and order it online and have it come right to my doorstep, beautifully fresh and amazing. But someday I will have it in Seattle. Oh, okay, wait, hold on. I, she is using, she is using a wooden cutting board, a wooden cutting board which is probably not the best, but it looks like it might be coated. It looked like it might be a sealed one. So, hmm, did I see what Vermin Hand said? No, I didn't. Is this a bad dragon dildo stroker combined into one? Bad dragon wishes. Bad dragon wishes they could get that level of fucking realism. They wish. Someday, I will, I would love to actually go fishing for gooey duck. I love digging for clams here in Rhode Island. Why is a wooden cutting board bad? So wooden, okay, so wooden cutting boards are, um, 
they're absorbent. So if you have a wooden cutting board, you don't want to cut um, meat or other, uh, 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 or, or seafood or fish or anything that can soak into the wood and grow bacteria in the wood. Because then you'll be, every time you cut on it, you'll be uh, at risk of cross-contaminating. Yeah, so you gotta be really careful. Um, if you have uh, if you have a wooden cutting board, there are certain types of wooden wooden cutting boards that are like pressure treated or something along those lines. I, I don't know the the science behind the treatment process, but they like they seal them in a layer of protective whatever, and the wood is just for looks basically, and those are usually okay. But if you have like your sort of standard store bought wooden cutting board, you should really only use those for vegetables, and you should get something. Um, you should get something that is, uh, that is non-porous for everything else. Plastic for meats, exactly, yep. Yep, 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 yep. Our clams that we love to dig for are called steamers. They look a lot like a gooey duck, but they're a fraction of the size, but it is so much fun. It's like treasure hunting. It's just a delight. Now, I'm gonna put these on a plate. I'm gonna serve these sashimi style, just like this. Alrighty, so there it is, the beautiful gooey duck, all ready for me to eat. Oh, I'm gonna slice up some belly too, because I really wanna taste that as well. This part is really tender. Much softer in consistency than the siphon. Ooh, I'm Rosa, so she's curious gonna eat to part of that raw? Okay. Like have so fun shitting your guts out? No, 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 no. This, to be fair, this is a like a, a, a pretty, like, pretty major, she has 2.85 million subscribers and, a, and I, as from what I understand, she's a professional chef and this was overnighted in a, in a frozen box. She paid $80 for this. I highly doubt there's much risk of food poisoning. I do get a little nervous about eating raw shellfish in general, but this is about the safest way you could do it outside of getting it fresh off the truck. Belly portion over here. One of my Thankfully. favorite things in the world is going clamming with my boys and eating raw clams on the beach. It's just, it's perfect. It's really what it is. So Becky recommends a squeeze of lemon juice, soy sauce, and a little bit of olive oil. But I'm gonna do this sashimi style and just have it right out of the ocean as it came. So let's give us a taste. I'm so, so excited. Alrighty, itadakimasu. so delicious it is so sweet that is the sweetest clam i've ever had and we eat plenty of clams i love nothing more than going clamming with my family i love the whole process of treasure hunting digging finding feeling triumphant when you find a clam we have a couple different varieties including steamers which are my personal favorite but we also True. have cherry stones God and, is trans girl. and cohogs and we love taking the cohogs or the little necks and smashing them like a caveman on a rock. We, meaning my family, particularly my kiddos, and just eating the clams right there on the rock with a little bit of sand, just gritty and just grinning with the joy of eating clams on the shore. And this reminds me of that. Sand. It just tastes beautifully of the sea. Oh, hold a on a second. Did I just hear that right? Just gritty and just just eating the clams right there on the rock with a little bit of sand, just gritty and just grinning with the joy of eating clams on the shore. Well, I mean, I get the experience, but like, why, why would you, the sand is the least, is like the most definitively unpleasant part of that entire entire experience the sand does not add flavor it hurts your teeth okay all right all right all right and this reminds me of that it just tastes beautifully of the sea just a little bit salty but mostly it is sweet it is sweet it has a beautiful beautiful flavor and a delightful crunchy texture. It's toothsome. It's just delicious. It's not overly salty. Sometimes if you have oysters on the half shell, they're almost too briny with salt water. This is just the perfect balance of just 
umami is really what it is, which I feel like is sometimes an overused word, but it's of the ocean. It's simultaneously sweet and salty, but this no, is No, I haven't so... yet. I haven't yet personally had geoduck, a uh, gooey duck. Geoduck. Gooey duck. Uh, I have had lots of seafood. Uh, I grew up in uh, in a uh, right next to the ocean, very, very close to the ocean. So not literally right next to it, but very close to the ocean. So I, I quite enjoy seafood. I love clams. I love mussels. I love all kinds of stuff like that, but but yeah. Oh, so, so sweet, and the texture is phenomenal. Mmm. Huh. <laughs> so that was the tip of the siphon, and it has a much bigger crunch, more cartilaginous. Yes, that's what the crunch is like. Kind of like the cartilage that you can find in the keel of a, of a chicken, that kind of cartilaginous crunch. It's delightful. Once you get closer to the base of the siphon, the crunch is still there, but it's not as hard. Delicious. Oh. Okay, now let's try the belly. Mm. Mm. The belly is delicious too. A completely different texture, a much tenderer texture, more similar to a raw quahog, but not so chewy and has a great clammy flavor to it but still so sweet. So you won't eat the clam raw? I would eat the clam raw, of course I would. I would of course do it if I, if I knew that it was prepared well, I just get nervous. Gooey duck is incredible. Definitely one of my favorite shellfish ever, ever, ever. It's so scrumptious, so scrumptious. So much to be thankful for in this beautiful world so so much including very ancient well na not now not the the gooey duck because you ate him he's not he's got nothing to be thankful for he's fucking dead that motherfucker's dead bivalves. thank you and thank you guys so much for watching i hope you guys enjoyed that at least she's thankful. i hope you guys learned something big thanks to bright sellers for sponsoring this video if you'd like to receive 50 percent off your first box of six well, boxes, I'll rip bozo rip clam bottles of wine click the link down below all right cool all right that was fun all right that was a fun video thanks for recommending I, that was a weird watch but uh but you know what uh i'm here for it you you guys want to watch one other thing do you guys want to check out one other food thing? No, no, we have so much other stuff we got to do. No, you know what? We're going to watch it. No, 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 we have, we, this one is not, this one's not a funny one. This one's cool as shit, okay? Oh, it's so long though. Ah, whatever, I don't care. It's so interesting. You guys ready? This is sick, this is sick as fuck, Are you fuck, team okay? This is a, this is a video by Tasting History with Max Miller. It's about pemmican. And by the way, if you guys know like, look, just just watch. I'm telling you, this is a really good one, okay? You guys gotta know about pemmican, okay? I'm kind of obsessed with pemmican. It's spelled like this. Pemmican, okay? And it's it's super interesting, okay? Pemmican is like the ultimate survival food. And um, yeah, it's funny that you mentioned it last stream because I just watched this doc this like mini documentary, but it's super, super interesting. Just I'm telling you. Knowing how to make pemmican, even a little bit, is like really cool. It's like, wow, I've learned how to eat the food that like, like 20,000 years of human history kept people alive through winter. It's, uh, it's, it's basically, so if you guys want to understand what pemmican is, imagine like the most disgusting power bar that you've ever had in your entire life, but it keeps you alive. Like power bars, you know, like cliff bars and shit. Cliff bars are the same basic idea. What make so like cliff bars have a bunch of compacted nuts and berries, and then they have fat mixed in. Usually because like we care about like vegetarianism and stuff, now it will be a vegetable fat that's mixed in. But in the past they would have used a meat fat. Is that the shit in Pathologic? It is in Pathologic. It's the shit that's really awesome in Pathologic because you can trade for it because most people don't want it and it gives you lots of hunger back. The little fat meat pie. Yeah, yeah, this is sick as fuck. He's gonna show us how to make pemmican and it's super awesome. This video is really, really cool. I thought the ultimate survival food was your own urine or did Bear Grylls lie to, lie to us? I'll let you think about that one, okay?
Pemmican or Pemmicant? Well, if you've ever considered setting out on a year-long journey across the Canadian wilderness, then you better be the former so you can make this dried meat treat called Pemmican. So thank you to Babbel for sponsoring this video as we make one of North America's oldest dishes, Pemmican. This time on Tasting History. So this has to be one of the most the requested so cool. dishes that I've done here on the channel. Basically, ever since I did that- It's not hardtack. Hardtack is something completely different. Hardtack is like dehydrated bread. This is something different. That video on hardtack, people have been asking me to make the meaty version of a survival food that has a shelf life measured not in months, but in decades, just like hardtack. Decades. That's right, pemmican can last fucking forever. Forever. It's like a time machine for shitty food. And just like it's cracker like- And yes, Gold Teeth, uh, Keith, I do watch the Townsend's channel. Um, yeah, I watch that fre frequently. Like cousin, pemmican is less of an Epicurean delight and more of just a means to an end. It's not something that you're going to be serving at your next dinner party, but something that you'll be really glad you have when you are trekking through the Arctic. The word pemmican is derived from the Cree word for processed fat. Now, while it's the Cree word that is typically used today, pemmican was and still is made today by Native American tribes all over North America under many different names and with slight variations to the preparation. But at its core, pemmican is meat of any kind, dried and pounded and saturated with fat. There is as much nourishment in one pound of pemmican as in four pounds of ordinary meat. That's fucking wild! That is wild! That is some concentrated survival calories right there. Can you- can you imagine? Can you imagine being like- um, like living on a mountain in the middle of nowhere and being like, Damn, I'm scared for winter, and then taking like four days to make a fuckload of pemmican and being like, never mind. That's wild! And that meat can be pretty much anything. There are old descriptions that talk about pemmican made of venison, beaver, elk, duck, rabbit, and even fish. Though perhaps the most common version, or at least the most well-documented version, was made of buffalo. And that's the kind that Lewis and Clark had as they journeyed across the plains searching for a passage to the Pacific. Some hunters were sent out to kill buffalo in order to make pemmican to take with us. Pemmington is buffalo meat, dried or baked. <laughs> pemmington! <laughs> pounded and mixed with grease. We eat an immensity of meat. It requires four deer, an elk and a deer, or one buffalo to supply us plentifully 24 hours. Meat now forms our food principally, as we reserve our flour, parched meal, and corn as much as possible for the rocky mountains which we are shortly to enter, and where, from the Indian account, game is not very abundant. So even if they couldn't agree on a spelling of the word pemmican, I have decided to follow their lead and make my pemmican out of buffalo. And let's take just a moment and talk about that word, buffalo. That is not a buffalo, it is a bison. And yes, that is correct. The American buffalo is not, in fact, a buffalo, which is an entirely different genus with the rather whimsical name bubalina or bubalus. Oh, look at these bubalas. But most people in the last 300 years have not made so that cute. distinction and have called the bison buffalo. Hence the buffalo nickel, buffalo bill, and many North American cities called buffalo. So I know it is actually called a bison. Heck, the scientific name is bison bison. Ah, the visible Isabel says, now I need that piece of trivia. What was the name of the elven bread in Lord of the Rings? Lemboss bread. That's right, motherfuckers! I know my fucking Lord of the Rings trivia like nobody fucking else besides Doe, okay? Doe has me beat. Lemboss bread. Right! And the Plains Bison has the scientific name Bison Bison Bison. It really, really wants you to know I am a bison. But as most writings from the period I'm going to be discussing call it a buffalo, I will be using the term interchangeably throughout this video. And if you want to blame somebody for calling it a buffalo, go ahead and blame the French, because it was French fur trappers in the 1600s who first called bison buffalo, the word being related to the French term for beef. Do you think you would rather have pemmican or dwarf bread on a journey? Pemmican. 
Dwarf bread? I don't know what dwarf bread is, but I'm gonna go with pemmican. Sorry. Or boeuf, something that you can learn when studying French with today's sponsor, Babbel. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world. And one thing that I love about them is their short 10 minute lessons. It allows me to squeeze in a lesson here and there throughout the day. And they're all taught by actual language teachers rather than put together by some AI. And since they teach real world conversations, they're perfect for things like travel. And that's why I am actually brushing up on my high school French because I'm hoping to plan a trip to France. For Though to help my just click my if you're using bison, buffalo, or some other meat, you need about two pounds or one kilogram of it. And you want to make sure to trim off as much fat as possible. So if you are using a fatty meat like beef, get the leanest cut that you possibly can. Then slice it very thin and preferably against the grain, which will make it easier to break up later on. But if you don't do it against the grain, not a huge deal. Also, to make it easier to slice very thinly, if you don't have a deli slicer at home, you can actually put it in the freezer for about 30 minutes. You don't want it frozen, but it will firm up and it just makes it a lot easier to slice thinly. Then lay the strips out on a wire rack and put them into the oven at the lowest temperature that your oven will do. Mine was 170 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 77 degrees uh, Celsius, and that seems to be the standard. Also, make sure to put a pan in the very bottom of the oven because no matter how lean your meat is, it will drip a little bit of fat, and one, it stinks if it falls onto the bottom of the oven, and two, it's really, really hard to clean. Now, of course, this would not have been done in an oven originally. The Curiosities of Food from 1859 said, the North American Indians dried their venison by exposing thin slices to the heat of the sun on a stage under which a small fire is kept, more for the purpose of driving away the flies than for promoting execution. And then they pound it between two stones on a bison hide. A more industrial method of drying it was developed in the 19th century by Sir John Richardson, a naval surgeon and Arctic explorer. Richardson was from Scotland, so naturally he saw a similarity between the drying of beef and the malting of barley used in the production of whiskey. So he took steaks of beef that were dried in a malt kiln over an oak fire until its moisture was entirely dissipated. It was then ground in a malt mill when it resembled finely grated meat. And so to be able to grind it up, you're gonna need to get it a That's lot correct. drier than just beef jerky you're looking to actually have it snap when you try to bend it. For me, that took about 10 hours in the oven. Also, yeah. if you're going to do this in a food dehydrator, that's fine, but put it into the oven at 200 degrees first uh, for about 30 minutes just to kill all of the bacteria. Now, I dried all of my meat and I actually kept a bit back because I wanted to try it here on camera, just the, the dried meat, but I wrapped it up and uh, today my cat took it and ate it himself. <laughs> bad kitty. So you just have to trust me when I say that the texture was that of very thin balsa wood and the flavor was that of the mere memory of beef. I'm kind of <laughs> certain that any flavor was, was all in my head. Anyway, once it is completely dried, you have to grind it up. I started with a mortar and pestle just so I could prove to myself that it could be done by hand. And once I had done so, I moved on and used a blender because it is just so, so much easier. Either way, you want to get it into a coarse powder. Now, the only other ingredient that you absolutely need for this is fat. The fat, which is generally the suet of the bison, is added by the traders who purchase it separately from the natives. So like I said, the meat and the fat are actually the only two ingredients that you must have for the pemmican. But according to Sir John Richardson, to render it more agreeable to the unaccustomed palate, a proportion of the best Zante currants was added to part of it. And part of it was sweetened with sugar. So you can add in- Yeah, so most, like, like a lot of pemmican in the past was mixed with uh, berries or some sort of sweetening agent or some sort of seasoning some sugar or Zante currants or really any kind of dried berry. The earliest descriptions that I could find called for either Saskatoon berries or choke berries. And even though Saskatoon is much cooler sounding, I couldn't find them. So instead I was able to get choke berries. And they look a lot like currants or, or any kind of small dried raisin, but the flavor is not the same. They're not that sweet. They, um, they're not bad. They're just kind of 
they're astringent. Like I really could use some water right now. Definitely on the more sour side. It's not sour per se, but it's not sweet either. Regardless of what berry you use, if you use any berry, you'll want them chopped up very fine or ground into as close a powder as you can. The only other ingredient that I could find in any historical recipes was salt, and that really didn't show up until like the early 20th century, but I am guessing that it would help with the shelf life as well as probably the flavor. So to put everything together, mix the meat with all of the other dried ingredients while you melt the fat over a low heat. Now, different 19th century recipes have different amounts of fat. Sometimes it's a one-to-one -one ratio, same weight of fat to the same weight of dried meat, and sometimes it's a little bit less fat. So I would go ahead and have the same amount weight-wise, but you might not need to use it all. Just use enough so that everything comes together, because it can be really greasy if you use too much. Also, use gloves if you're going to mix this by hand, which I suggest you do, because the fat on your hands, it takes forever to get off. Use gloves. Then once everything is mixed, you can complete the process by sewing up the pemmican in a bag of undressed hide with the hairy side outwards. You <laughs> I'm, I'm, so, I'm so happy they posted that. Yeah, put the hair outside, you idiots. <laughs> Don't have a bag of undressed hide, you say? Well, I suppose you can use a tin can, which was often used in the 19th century and then soldered shut, or for our purposes, I'm just putting it into a mold. I'm using a tiny one egg pan and a pinch bowl. You can even just form it up with your hands, just make it fairly compact, whatever shape you end up making it in, and then let it cool. And while it firms up, make sure to check out Tasting History on Facebook and Reddit, as well as Patreon, because it is the support of my patrons that keeps this channel going even during the lean times, just as Pemmican did for travelers oh so many years ago. When and where pemmican was invented is anyone's guess, but it was definitely a long time ago because it was being made all over North America by the time European colonists came. One of the first people to actually mention it in his writings was the fur trader Peter Pond, who was also a founder of the Northwest Company in Canada. One of his partners, Sir Alexander Mackenzie, was a Scottish explorer who completed the first known, or rather first documented, crossing of North America, at least above Mexico, because there are parts of Mexico which you can walk across in a matter of days. Now, pemmican was a staple of Mackenzie's diet, and he relied on it throughout the expedition, but especially on his return voyage. As I was very sensible of the difficulty of procuring provisions in this country, I thought it prudent to guard against any possibility of distress of that kind on our return. I therefore ordered 90 pounds weight of pemmican to be buried in a hole, sufficiently deep to admit of a fire over it, without doing any injury to our hidden treasure, and which would at the same time secure it from the natives of the country or the wild animals of the woods. So 90 pound bags actually seem to be the standard size for pemmican, and it makes sense because one bison cow in good condition furnished dried meat and fat enough to make a bag of pemmican weighing 90 pounds. Why was writing so LARPy back then? What? You're talking about a guy, look, you're talking about a guy who sailed across the planet and then crossed a continent in a period of time where you didn't know anything. You may as well have been traveling to an, to like a, a, an alien planet. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, fucking LARPers, fucking, fucking having to bury 90 pounds of like disgusting pemmican in the ground so they don't starve when they sail back across the Atlantic. Oh my God, what a bunch of LARPy losers. And I just imagine these 90 pound huge globs of meat dried with fat. And I wish that there were like photos looking inside of these bags because can't really picture it. I'm guessing they just like broke off hunks of it. I don't know, but ours is going to be a lot less. Now, while Mackenzie stored his pemmican away for his return trip, he had plenty of time to think of ways to kind of spruce it up and make it a little bit more exciting. He did eat it plain, but he also boiled it with. <laughs> who the who the hell who the hell buried this fucking who the hell buried this fucking fat shit in the ground? the tops of parsnips, and on the banks of the river there was great plenty of wild onions, which, when mixed up with our pemmican, was a great improvement of it, though they produced a physical effect on our appetites, which was rather inconvenient to the state of our provisions. 
He says that because for much of the journey they were running dangerously low on food. At one point, he says, I was also compelled to confine them to two meals a day, a regulation peculiarly offensive to a Canadian voyager. One of these meals was composed of the dried rows of fish, pounded and boiled in water, thickened with a small quantity of flour, and fattened with a bit of grain. These articles, being brought to the consistency of a hasty pudding, produced a substantial and not unpleasant dish. I'd probably stick to my pemmican over the fish pudding. I have had- God, that's disgusting. Oh, fish pudding is like, oh no. Had some bad luck with fish puddings in the past. And I'm a glutton for punishment because I'm making another quasi-fish pudding next week. Now, as I said, pemmican was, under many names, a product of pretty much every nation native to North America, or at least the northern half of North America. But there was one group that had Ruined a stronger, or at least more famous, connection to it. The Meti people of Canada had a unique culture as they were the descendants of indigenous women, mostly Algonquin, Ojibwe, and Cree, and European men, mostly French, Scottish, and English fur traders. Their name, Meti, came from French and referred to this mixed parentage, and they were often bilingual, which put them in a good position to work with and trade with the colonists. And one of their major trade commodities was pemmican. Twice a year, Meti hunting parties would go out to hunt bison. The men would hunt, and the women would butcher and dry the meat. One hunting party could return with as much as one million pounds of pemmican. And considering one bison yes. made 90 pounds of pemmican, that's a lot of bison. They would keep a portion for themselves, but then they would trade or sell off the rest. Well, around the year 1800, they had two main so, trading Ashmar. partners, and they were both companies. There was the Hudson's Bay Company, which was the major player in the fur trade because they actually had a charter from the king and got a lot of help from England. Then there was the Northwest Company, a little bit more of an upstart, so they relied all the more on trading with the Métis. Now, it was around this time that back in Scotland, the Highland clearances were going on, and this was a period where lords were kicking people off of their land to put sheep on, uh, because sheep grazing made a lot more money. Even today, you go to the Highlands, there are a lot of sheep. But Thomas Douglas, 5th Earl of Selkirk, was moving these Highlanders to Canada, where he was starting colonies. And he had started two before engaging in what essentially was a hostile takeover, buying up the majority share of the Hudson's Bay Company, after which he gave himself, or allowed himself, to use the land for a third colony around the Red River watershed. Now, this land was used by both companies and was the home of many Native American tribes, including the Métis. And as colonists and people started coming in, the provisions and the amount of pemmican didn't seem quite sufficient. Well, the Northwest Company kind of saw this happening, and so they bought up a lot of extra pemmican to make sure that all of their employees would be fed as they traveled north to do fur trapping. In response, this led the governor, Miles McDonnell, to issue the Pemmican Proclamation, which limited- They had a whole fucking proclamation about the Pemmican. That's how fucking, that's how fucking op Pemmican is. Historically. the number of buffalo or bison that the Métis could hunt, and it made it so neither company's men were allowed to take any food out of the region. Well, both companies and the Métis complained, but the Hudson's Bay Company was still getting help from uh, home in England, and their majority shareholder was kind of the owner now of the area, so they were less worried than were the Métis and the Northwest Company. Well, the latter two groups decided to just ignore the proclamation and even plotted to attack the colony. And to paraphrase Yoda, begun the Pemmican War has. Essentially, it was the Northwest Company and the Métis against the colonists and the Hudson's Bay Company. Tensions rise, militias were gathered, and violence broke out. At one point, the Métis and Northwesterners destroyed the colony, and the whole thing Ace. culminated in the Battle of Seven Oaks in 1816. Now, to realize just how insane this is, it's best to put it into a modern setting. So imagine that the government decided to put a cap on the amount of caramel color that could be made and, uh, and sold. Well, you've got Coca-Cola on one side, 
and Pepsi Company on the other side vying for the remaining caramel color. So both actually raise private armies and begin skirmishing with each other. And it goes on until the city of Atlanta is destroyed and there is a pitched battle along I-85. It's madness. And the only thing that ended up kind of stopping this going on, not the Coke and Pepsi one, the, the actual one back in the 1800s, was that England stepped in. They had been fighting the War of 1812 and Napoleon and had been Listen, everybody in chat's laughing right now, but you're gonna, you're gonna be, you won't be laughing when you get conscripted into the Pemmican Wars of 2025, okay? So keep it to yourselves, you know? You know, just, you know, keep that in mind. Laugh while you can, and, uh, and, you know, be ready, because... You know, not really paying attention to what was going on. Well, that was all over, so finally they step in and are like, you gotta, you gotta get along better, and... They encourage them to form one Restricts. company, and that's how it, how it ended. But it's pretty nuts. And it, the fact that all of that happened over Pemmican makes me really curious to try this stuff. And here we are, Pemmican, history's oh, power bar. Yeah, so this is the yeah. little one. Uh, I guess I'm just going to break off a piece. It is kind of crumbly. Um, And if you're really, really hungry, it's fine. Kind of tastes like beef jerky, but the texture is very crumbly. I gotta say, the berries don't do anything. I think adding sugar would probably be a good thing, but I'm not sure that it's gonna be great either way. Part of it is the fat is just... Put the screw in the tuna says, I'm allergic to gluten and beef. I will not be surviving the apocalypse. Y'all be easy though. Hey, wait a second. You can survive the apocalypse. You can survive the apocalypse by going to a coastline. A coastline will be your greatest friend where you can spend the rest of your life digging clams out of the mud and gooey ducks like we just watched. See, I gave I gave you the not the gluten free beef free option. And now you have the gluten and beef option of coating your mouth and you can really taste it don't use more fat than you need to get it to come together it's just yeah don't use more than you need the thing is well before or after the coast is flooded well keep in mind that the, once the coast floods that just makes more space for clams to live it was often eaten by itself it could also be cooked to make it more palatable a journal entry from 1874 says oh. it was oh, oh sorry sorry i don't mean to keep interrupting this great video we're watching but i just hope you know it's the clams it's the clams and the mollusks that are going to save us from the microplastics you know i hope you i hope you realize that okay like those motherfuckers have been working overtime they like suck up all the microplastics and then they die and it's all contained in their body so that you don't have to eat it. So thank your local clam and worship your local mollusk god. Because, uh, yeah. Cooked in two ways in the West. One, a stew of pemmican, water, flour, and if they could be secured, wild onions or preserved potatoes. This was called rubabu. The other was called by the plain hunters a rechaud. It was cooked in a frying pan with onions and potatoes or alone. Some persons ate pemmican raw, but I must say that I never had a taste for it that way. And I also didn't have a taste for it that way, so I am going to do as I did with hardtack and save this for an entire year. And in a year, I'm going to come back, as it would have been aged, you know, for quite some time back in the day, and make a dish of probably rubavu, if I'm saying that right. I found several different spellings, and I'm just assuming that's how you say it, but if not, please correct me. So that episode should come out in about a year. In the meantime, if you haven't seen either the original hardtack video or the one where a year later I made it into what was called Civil War Hellfire Stew, I'm gonna put that video, both of those videos, down Damn, here so, so you can cool. watch them, and I will see you next time on Tasting History. Wasn't that awesome? Now you all know the basics of how to create 
one of the most important survival foods in the entire history of the entire human race. And it's incredibly, incredibly easy to make. All you got to do is dry the fuck out of some meat, melt the fuck out of some fat, grind it all together, pack it as tightly as possible, and you're fucking good to go. Isn't that fucking sick? Damn, I'm glad we decided to do uh, Cooking Mama. This guy's channel is really good, by the way. This guy's channel is called Tasting History with Max Miller. I really like his stuff. I've watched a lot of his videos. It's really good. Yeah, Townsend's also did a video on Pemmican. As it turns out, Pemmican is historically incredibly impactful. <sighs> we'll check in on Dave next time. Oh, the Garum one. Yeah, the Garum one is really good. There's so many cool things. It's so fucking interesting. Look, I, I just find it amazing and interesting.